Goals was the key to being successful. But the more I think about it, the more I reflect on it, the more I realize that accepting responsibility for your life is the starting point of all great accomplishment. And it's been well said over and over again that it's not the government and it's not our parents and it's not your boss and it's not your family or your bills. It's you. One of the things I found, and sometimes it's hard to get used to, is the fact that no one else can live your life for you. No one else can make decisions for you. And in the final analysis, no one else really cares. And without the acceptance of responsibility, nothing else is possible. Walking, talking, thinking, and acting like a fully responsible human being gives you a feeling of calmness, confidence, and self-control. Your income, your status, your security, your power will always tend to be equal to the responsibilities you take on. This is one distinct area where winners and losers part company. Winners always look upon themselves as the cause of what happens to them. Losers are always blaming someone or something else. We know that people always seek the fastest and easiest way to get the things they want. And if something goes wrong, the thing that they want is to get off the hook. So the fastest and easiest way is always to blame someone else. But when we blame someone else to that degree, we give control of the problem to that other person and we take control away from ourselves. And we become more and more negative and frustrated the more we try to make other people responsible for things in our life that we don't like. In fact, if you stop blaming other people, you'll find that most of your negative emotions will go away. If you can't blame anybody, and the way you stop blaming is to accept responsibility. Losers never accept responsibility, and winners always do. When things go well for losers, they blame it on luck. And when things go poorly for losers, they blame it on the system. But winners accept both the credit and the blame for everything that happens to them. Fully responsible adults always look upon themselves as self-employed. They act as if they own the place. They treat the company they work for as though it belongs to them. The worst mistake you can ever make in your life is to ever think that you work for anybody else but yourself. All peak performers in every field and industry look upon themselves as though they worked for them. Even if somebody else signs their paycheck, they look upon themselves as being self-employed and they treat the company as though everything that happened in that company was theirs. They accept full responsibility. If a paperclip falls on the floor, they pick it up. They never say, that's not my job. When they refer to their company, they say us and our and we instead of they and them and the uh, boss and so on. Wherever you see an employee who is not totally committed to the company and to their work, you see a problem and you see a person that you should never allocate more responsibility to. When we come out of school, we sometimes make the mistake of thinking that if we are to be educated further, it is up to our employer to do it. And this is one of the worst mistakes that you can make because irrespective of whether or not your employer offers you training opportunities, you are 100% responsible for continuing to upgrade your skills. Now here's another area of responsibility. The winner always asks, what results are expected of me? One of the qualities of peak performers is that they are always very results oriented. They always ask themselves, why am I on the payroll? And if you're not sure why you're on the payroll, the first thing that you have to do is go and sit down with your boss and ask him, why am I on the payroll? And now you don't have to use these words, but here's a very simple technique taken right out of job description of what you think that you're on the payroll to. Write out a list of all the things that you're supposed to accomplish and give it to your boss. Have your boss organize that list in order of priority. Which is most important, which is second in importance, which is third in importance. And then always work on what is most important to your boss. Ask yourself what can I and only I do that if done well will make a real difference to my company. If you own your own company, this question is even more important. But working for another company, this is the key to rapid advancement and promotion and do what will make a difference. To accept responsibility for specific results and always results that will make a difference, winners always focus on solutions. They ask, where do we go from here? What do we do from here? There's a big difference between winners and losers. Winners always look to the future 
and losers always look to the past. Winners always look to what can be done, and losers always look at who's to blame. Losers focus on problems, winners focus on solutions. Winners always look to themselves when there is a problem. Losers always look to others. So if you want to achieve success within your work, always look to yourself whenever things don't go right. The rejection of responsibility leads to negative emotions. It leads to stress that leads to denial and anger and frustration, and often psychosomatic illness. A negative mind actually depresses the immune system and makes the body sick. I think the refusal to accept responsibility for one's life is the primary reason for negativity and unhappiness in our society today. Many doctors are asking patients a question like this, why did you need this illness? Why did you need dissonance? Because what they're finding is that when people become sick, it's almost invariably because they need an illness to help them avoid dealing with some situation in their life. So what they do is they contract an illness which is consistent with the severity of the situation. For instance, if you're feeling a little bit tired and overworked, you can contract a cold or the flu. If you're feeling very, very harassed or frustrated in your life, you get something worse. Right up to and including heart disease, strokes, and cancer. They found that many sick people, and especially very sick people, have a tendency to hold grudges for long periods of time and that forgiving others is a vital part of getting over the illness. In my experience, if you cannot forgive offenses against you to that degree, you are held back from success, and the more grudges you have, the more bitter you are, the less forgiving you are, the more unhappy you will be all of your life. So make it a rule, as they say, never to let the sun go down in your anger. Make it a rule to forgive everybody in your life who has ever done anything that has hurt you, and let it go past so that you can commit all of your energy to start accomplishing the things that you really want in life. Well, what have we learned with regard to responsibility? Number one is that the acceptance of responsibility for your life is the stepping stone to peak performance. And until you accept responsibility for your life, nothing happens. Number two is the more self-responsible you feel, the more control you have, and the better you like yourself, and the higher is your self-esteem. Number three, the expression of negative emotions caused by blaming others causes you to lose control and suffer diminished self-esteem. So catch yourself and stop yourself from blaming others by catching yourself and saying, I am responsible. I am responsible. I am responsible. Remember, the responsible person is solution-oriented, focused on the future rather than the past and on what can be done versus who did what. Well, human beings make mistakes because we are anxious to get things and to do things the fastest and easiest way because often we're ignorant and we don't know everything we need to know because often we're ambitious. We're in a hurry because often we are vain and our egos get in the way. Because of these things, we make mistakes and all human beings make mistakes. A person who cannot accept the fact that others make mistakes is not cut out for greatness, is not cut out for leadership. Number five, the acceptance of complete responsibility for your success is the starting point of all great achievement. We come one all around and say that if anything that is going to happen to you or for you in life is up to you, that you cannot wait or hope that other people will do things for you, that you must take complete charge. Now, you will find a very interesting thing. When you accept total responsibility for your life, other people will help you. And if you don't, nobody will help you. Even if they do, it won't do any good. So say to yourself, what is it that I want to accomplish? Where do I want to go? Where do I want to be? What do I want to have? And what do I have to do to get there? And then take full charge of the process. Number six, make a habit of forgiving others, never carrying grudges around. Keep your mind calm, positive, and focused on your goals. Your ability to eliminate the expression of negative emotions, to keep your mind positive by not becoming angry or frustrated, is a hallmark of the successful personality and the healthy personality. Your tendency to blame others, to hold grudges, not to forgive others, is something that can cause you to fail and to underachieve in life. Number seven, finally ask yourself each day, what kind of a company would my company be if everybody in it was just like me? What kind of a company would my company be if everybody in it was just like me?
This is the question of the truly responsible individual, and you will be amazed at how rapidly an attitude of responsibility can accelerate your career. If you walk, talk, and act like a responsible, self-assured individual, you will begin to feel calm, confident, and positive about yourself. If you will resist the expediency factor, the tendency to blame others when things go wrong, if you will discipline yourself to accept full responsibility for what happens in your life, it will raise yourself a team and make you feel much better about yourself and everything that you're doing. By practicing the self-discipline necessary to refrain from blaming anyone for anything, you will develop courage, character, and self-esteem. If you do what successful people do, you will be successful too, and all successful men and women are self-responsible. The rules for achieving financial independence are simple. The rules are as follows. Rule number one is, spend less than you earn. Five words. And then, save or invest the difference. This has always been the case. This is the key to financial success. Going back to the richest man in Babylon by Clayson more than 2,000 years ago. You can be a blithering idiot at an average job, working at a gas station or on a farm, or driving a truck at an average wage. But if you save $100 a month on average from age 20 to age 65, and let it accumulate, you'll be worth more than a million dollars. $100 a month. $25 a week or less than $4 a day. How about the same amount as buying a latte coffee at Starbucks? Can you do that? Okay, well, do lots of other things, but do that for sure. Now, rule number two for achieving financial independence is that 10% of every dollar you earn is yours to keep. What this means is that you need to develop a habit from the beginning of your career and throughout of cutting 10% off the top of your salary and living on the other 90%. Most people get their paycheck and they spend most of it. If there's anything left over, they throw it in the bank temporarily and then they grab it out and spend it on something else. They look at their bank account and shout, gee, we've got money here, let's burn it. Some people have just got to get rid of the money. Rule number three is to resolve in advance to prefer financial independence to status. The work in the millionaire next door found that the mark of self-made millionaires is that they weren't concerned about impressing the neighbors or keeping up with the Joneses. They were more concerned with financial independence than by looking good on the outside, at least until they became wealthy. So say to yourself, financial independence is number one to me, and status is number one to me, and status is number two or three or four or ten. Then be willing to stick to it. It's absolutely amazing what will happen to you financially. Do you know what we found out about self-made millionaires? They never buy new cars. Why? Why? Because in a new car, there's several thousand dollars of depreciation. It's money that you lose the minute you drive it off the lot. So what self-made millionaires do, based on interviews with thousands of them, is they pick a car they really like, they follow it in consumer reports and J-Power for quality and service, and then about two to three years out, they look for used models with low mileage and good service records. And then they buy a car that 20 to 25 percent in depreciation has already been taken out of. I've worked with a man once who started with nothing and achieved a net worth of $800 million. Now he lived in a nice normal neighborhood, you know, with doctors and lawyers and architects, but not ostentatious but not ostentatious. But the people living on either side of him were just two paychecks away from homelessness. If their income was cut off for two months, they wouldn't be able to make their mortgage payments. I watched this guy. He drove the same used car for three or four years. He liked Cadillacs. He'd get a nice Cadillac, take good care of it, then he'd get another used or loaner vehicle from a dealership so that it had already been depreciated. He was never ostentatious at all. And he ended up one of the richest men in America. When you met him, he'd be wearing an old sweater. He didn't have a huge wardrobe or the same suits to meetings, and he had no bills at all. But when he wanted to go somewhere, he'd fly in his private $25 million jet all by himself. Now, back to the last rule for achieving financial independence. Rule number four is once you put the money away, never touch it. Now, this is important. So if you're writing it down, write it in red. You see, 
Many of us make the mistake of thinking that if you save money, you put that money away so you can have it. It's fun money. So when you decide, I want to buy a car, or I want to go on a trip, I want a boat, I want to go on a trip, I want a boat, I want a motor home, you go and you get this money that you saved. However, if you want to spend money on those things, set up a separate savings account. This money is for your financial security. This is your financial freedom fund. Once you put money into this financial freedom account, you lock it in like a one-way door. It goes in and it never comes out. You never comes out. You never spend it. I can tell you all kinds of stories about how this will change your life, including in my life. But please believe me. Once you put it away and decide that you will never spend it as far as you're concerned, it's gone forever. I personally will do whatever is necessary, no matter what my financial emergency is, to not touch my financial fortress. Never touch it, because if you even think, even a tiny glimmer that you can get it if you need it, then you'll find yourself needing it at the first opportunity. So the key to financial success is, pay yourself first, save 10 of your account, buy used things rather than new, and once you put money away, never, never touch it. Put it away and let it stay there until it accumulates and enables you to do anything you want in life. Today, in America, it's a little different because of the state of the economy and, of course, you bought low and sold high. But very few of us did that. Uh, 10 to 20 percent per year after taxes and expenses in terms of growing your net worth is a pretty good goal. And it's ultimately achievable. So write down five figures representing your target net worth over the next five years. It seems remarkable, but the fact is that the starting point of increasing your income or your net worth is very simple. Can you guess what it is? Decide to do it. Make a decision to become financially independent. You say, well, it's not that simple. Well, it is that simple. It's just not easy. But it is simple. The primary reason that people don't succeed in life or finances is because they never decide to and then back up that decision with determination. Now there are a lot of things you can do after you've made a decision. There are very few things you can do before making a decision or without making a decision or without making a decision. So make that decision. Your decision may be wrong or it may be inaccurate, but at least it's a great starting point. It's like drawing a line in the ground that you step over. But what if I don't get it by such and such a date? Don't worry about it. At least get it on paper and take the first step. Once upon a time when I started my career, I sat down at the end of the year and my tax returns were $14,400. Twelve years later, I sat down and did my tax returns and my tax returns were $1,440,000. I'd increased my income by a hundred times in twelve years. And I went back and I started to look at that and I realized that I used a formula which I gradually articulated into what I call the thousand percent formula. And it's very simple. It's based on the law of uh, incremental improvement. Japanese call it the Kaizen principle, the principle of continuous betterment. It's getting a little bit better every day. So I asked the question, if you could increase your productivity, performance and output by one tenth of one percent per day, could you do that? Could you increase your productivity, performance, and output by one one thousandth a day? And the answer is, of course. If you're even the tiniest bit more efficient or you worked a little bit harder on a more important task, you could become a tenth of a percent better in a day. Well, if you did that every single day for a week, you would be one tenth of one percent times five. You'd be one half of one percent more productive in a week. Is that possible? Of course you would say, anybody can become that small amount more productive. So I said, if you did that every week for four weeks, you'd be 2% more productive over the course of a month. If you did that every day for 13, 4 week months in a year, 52 weeks, you would be 26% more productive. Is that possible? And the answer is yes, because there is a thing at success called the momentum principle. That means that once you start going, it becomes easier and easier to keep going and to go faster and faster. So once you become 26% more productive in the course of a year, your overall output, your results, your income will go up by 26%. What happens is you start to get into the swing of it. You start to be more effective, more efficient. You get more things done. 
you start earlier, you work harder, you stay later, you set better priorities, and so on. So if you do this 26% each year for 10 years, you will be 10.04% better. And this is what happened to me, and it's happened to every single person I've ever worked with. Not long ago, I was in Seattle, and this young man came up to me. He's about 30. I met him when he was about 22. He was working in a used car lot in a small town outside of Portland. His name is Chris, and he came up and said, Mr. Tracy, do you remember me? I said, yes, Chris, of course. Nice guy, great personality. He said, well, you know the thousand percent formula that you taught to me many years ago? I said, yes, I remember because I've taught it to so many people. He said, Brian, it doesn't work. I said, it doesn't work. He said, it doesn't work. I said, how do you mean? He smiled and said, it doesn't take 10 years. It only took me seven. He said, today he's earning 10 times what he was earning. Seven he is earning seven years ago. He said, I used it every day. It's absolutely amazing. I'm making more money today in a week or a month than I was often making in a month or a year by using that formula. What I did personally is I used it once, increased my income 10 times, and then I used it again and increased my income 10 times more. 100 times in 12 years. And so can you. There are two great principles of wealth attainment, and they're both equally important to understand and implement in order to be successful and acquire wealth. The first principle of wealth creation is make compound interest work in your favor. Einstein said that compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. Get that money in there and get it working for you. Interested Peter Lynch of Magellan said that it's not timing the market that makes you rich. It's time in the market that makes you rich. Remember, if you invested one dollar at three percent at the time of Christ, you'd be worth all the money in the world today with compound interest. Compound interest is phenomenal, so make it work in your favor by getting the money in there early and leaving it there to work. The second principle of wealth creation is to use dollar cost averaging. When you buy stocks, don't worry about being right every time or getting the lowest price when you buy. It doesn't really matter unless, of course, stocks are overpriced at the end of a boom. But if you invest a steady amount of money every week or every month or every week, year, then you'll end up buying things at the average price. The prices will go up and down, but you'll end up buying them high, buying them low, buying them average, and over time you'll get the very best average deal. Dollar cost averaging is one of the great techniques for financial success. Now, here's an example of dollar cost average investing. Steady, 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 year after year. I have a good friend who came over here as an immigrant at the age of 17. Couldn't even speak English. So, he began to learn English. And when he was 20 years old, he could speak enough English to begin studying financial success and going to college. Well, I had dinner with him not long ago. He had a four-acre property and a 16,000-square-foot home in a beautiful community on the East Coast. He's worth millions of dollars today. He owns banks and shopping centers and national corporation. Here's what happened. When he was 20, someone told him that real estate is the key to financial success. They're not making any more of it. You should own real estate. Well, he never thought about that, and at that time he was a student and didn't have very much money but he was working evenings and weekends to pay for his needs. Which is what they used to do in those days. So, he decided he would buy one piece of property each year. His first piece of property was in a small community outside of town. And it was a lot. And it cost $25 a month to service it. He had to sweat. It's to make those monthly payments. But his goal was to buy one piece of property a year, and he kept on doing it. He's now 49 years old. And the last piece of property he bought last year was a $225 million shopping center. He still buys one property a year, only now they're much, much bigger. The skill and experience and discipline that he developed over time in buying those properties, which got bigger and bigger, made him a millionaire and then a multimillionaire. So what's your excuse? What's our excuse? We're surrounded by hundreds, thousands, even millions of these stories. What is our excuse? It's always one thing. What is it? It's lack of discipline. So remember, 
the two great principles of wealth creation. Making compound interest work for you by getting the money in there and working and using dollar cost averaging, whether it's buying stocks or real estate. Next is maximize. Determine your special talents, abilities and strengths and focus on developing them to a higher level. Then multiply is to leverage yourself and your business with other people's customers, other people's knowledge, other people's abilities, other people's efforts, other people's efforts, other people's money and other people's resources. Now you've heard the old saying it takes money to make money. Yes, that's true, but it doesn't have to be your money. It could be somebody else's money. All successful people have developed the ability to call on the money of others. Why? It's because they do good work and they do good planning and they take good care of their money and people line up to give them money. There's now trillions of dollars of money waiting. I have a good friend, one of my business partners, mostly a multi-millionaire, started with nothing and he's worth tens of millions of dollars. He's sitting on a pool of money that he keeps at very low levels of interest. He said, I can't find a place to put it and I will not put it until I find a place. If somebody could come along with any kind of a business proposition where the person has credibility and a track record and has a good business proposition, there's more money available than you can dream of. The money is there in torrents, like tsunamis of money that are available. That's why you're reading the paper. You read that such. And such company just paid one. Eight billion dollars or two. Six or nine. Nine or Google just offered Groupon six billion dollars cash for their business. There's lots of money for good business ideas, but it doesn't have to be your money. It can be somebody else's money and your ability to attract that money and to justify it is really important. Strategic planning is an essential part of the success formula. Your ability to create a clear and organized strategic plan will largely contribute to your success and wealth. In fact, it's virtually impossible to succeed greatly unless you have a clear idea of where you're going and how to get there. So, here are three key factors to remember when devising a strategic plan. Number one, you are in business for yourself. This means that everything that is ever going to happen to your personal success, corporation, your personal business is up to you. No one else can be expected to do it for you. Now, here's a perverse law. The more that you accept that you are responsible for doing whatever it is, the more others will line up to help you. So therefore you say these words, if it's to be, it's up to me. Number two, your aim in strategic planning is to increase your return on energy. Why call this row return on energy? The purpose of strategic planning in business is to increase return on equity. Right. Return capital working in the organization. But your capital is mental, emotional, and human. Your job is to get the most out of your mental, emotional, and intellectual capital. Your job is to get the highest return on energy. My friend Ken Blanchard says, you want to get the highest return on the amount of your life invested in your work. Number three. Successful individuals also have good personal strategic plans because a good strategic plan assures that you will get the highest return on the amount of energy that you invest in anything you do. A positive attitude is like a chicken and egg thing. If you're successful, you're positive. If you're positive, you're successful. Which comes first? It doesn't really matter. Positive thinkers are men and women who accomplish an awful lot more than people who have negative mental attitudes. Your job is to become thoroughly positive and constructive towards yourself. Your possibilities, the world around you, and the people in your life. The way you do this is very much the same way you develop physical fitness. We know that you can't see the results of mental fitness in the same way you can see physical fitness, but you can see the results of it 
Mental fitness comes from following a specific exercise program, doing things in a certain way every single day. It's much easier than going to a gym and sweating and working out. So I'm going to ask you to do this for me. I'm going to give you seven steps, seven things that you can do, seven things that have been proven to work. What I'm going to ask you to do is practice these seven steps for 21 days. The reason for this is that it takes 21 days to develop a new habit pattern of any kind. If you work on a habit pattern and practice it every day, you begin to develop new neural grooves in your brain that cause you to think and act more optimistically, automatically. You wake up in the morning feeling better, more positive toward the challenges you face during the day. You become more optimistic in the face of adversity. You start to become a more confident and optimistic person. When you do, you'll find your whole life opening up around you like sunshine on a bright morning. This is the great rule of success. Number one is positive self-talk. Positive self-talk has been getting very good press in the last little while. Positive self-talk means that you talk to yourself and make sure that your thoughts are on what you want and off of the things that you don't want. Successful people, positive people, are people who explain things to themselves in a positive way. They say, well, that's an interesting situation, or that'll work out okay, or don't worry about it. The second part of positive self-talk is to control your inner dialogue, to control what's happening inside you, and to be aware that the average person, if they're not careful, will have a tendency to be negative. Remember, 95% of your feelings are determined by the way you talk to yourself. It's absolutely essential that you talk to yourself the way that you want to be outside. What you see in your relationships, your health, your work, your customers, and so on, tend to be a result of the pictures you have inside. If you see yourself and think about yourself as an extraordinary person, if you see yourself as a success, if you see yourself as happy and positive, confident and in control, if you see yourself as a loving parent or spouse, you will act that way toward others. Your subconscious mind controls your reticular activating system or your reticular cortex as well. If you interview successful people, it's a very interesting thing. If you interview successful people and you ask them on a regular basis, what do you think about? What are you thinking about now? You find that successful people are always thinking constructive, positive, creative thoughts that help them to be more successful. Now, if you think about positive, constructive, success-oriented, happy things, you start to have more of those in your life. The fourth part of mental programming, the fourth part is positive people. We have a tendency to adopt the words, the actions, the behaviors, the mannerisms, the dress we associate with most of the time if we're not very careful. Get away from negative people, get around positive people, associate with winners in your life. The fifth part is positive training and development. Most of your success is going to come from other people. Most of your success is going to come from someone who helps you and people like to help other people who are good at what they do and who are pleasant and easy to get along with. When an hour a day, 30 to 60 minutes every day, will make you one of the greatest authorities in your field in a couple of years. Listen to educational and uplifting audio cassettes in your car. When all knowledge and skills are becoming obsolete, it's the ability to learn new things at a rapid rate. So dedicate yourself to lifelong continuous personal improvement. Number six is positive health habits. First of all, eat lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, lots of whole grain products. Second of all, stop eating fats, sugars, and salts. Third of all, drink lots of water. And fourth of all, get lots of exercise. Walk, head on to an aerobic exercise program. Regular rest and recreation are absolutely critical to having high levels of physical energy, which gives you the optimism and confidence to be able to bounce when you face the adversities of daily life rather than breaking. The seventh key, the mental fitness. We call this a sense of urgency. There are many qualities that you can develop to be successful, but a sense of urgency is possessed by less than 2% of the population. These are the people who are almost magnets for opportunities. I had to change my thinking. I had to change my philosophy. I'm telling you, my life exploded into change. My bank account changed immediately. My income changed immediately with a little consideration of the refinement of your sale by setting a better sale, refining your philosophy. Your whole life can start to change from the day on. You don't have to wait till tomorrow.
You don't have to wait till next month to start this whole process immediately. Now some people do so little thinking they don't even have their sale up. Now is the chance to change. Number one is velocity, my personal opinion, each person's personal philosophy. Here's the definition of success and failure. Sometimes the first year you say, well, you know, I'm so healthy now. What difference is it going to make? You've got to be smarter than that. Just because disaster doesn't fall on us at the end of the first day doesn't mean disaster isn't coming. You've got to be so smart that you look down the road and say, will the errors in my present judgment of philosophy, what's that going to cost me in one year, six years, one month, six months? I'm telling you, the money cost and the health cost and the success cost is too gigantic if you look down the road a little ways and say, are there errors in my current judgment? Like an apple versus a Hershey bar, is that just a good illustration of some of the rest of my errors in judgment? If it is, that's where I found myself at age 25. At the end of the first six years of my economic life, I've got pennies in my pocket, I've got nothing in the bank. The creditors are calling saying, Hey, you told us the check was in the mail. I'm embarrassed. I'm behind on my promise. I used to think it was the community that was messed up and the country was messed up. The government was messed up. Then I found out what was really messed up was my own personal philosophy. My own errors in judgment in my own personal philosophy brought me in six years, pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, and trying to explain why I wasn't doing well living in America as a 25-year-old American male with a family. Every reason to do well. Here's the formula for failure. Errors in judgment, being lax about developing your own personal philosophy. Come on now, let me give you the secret to success. The formula for failure. A few errors in judgment repeated every day for one month starts the weakness, starts the disaster process. You can imagine what happened. Now, here's the formula for success. A few simple discipline practices every day and you've started the whole new process called a whole new life. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. It's not only with your health habits but with your money habits and with your communication habits, with your sales habits, management habits and every other habit that you've got. If you start that process, eliminate the errors and replace it with discipline practice, you can start this process of life change immediately after today. You don't ever have to be the same again. You don't have to start with something staggering. What if you should be walking around the block for your good health and you don't? What will that do in six years? I'm telling you, the word is disaster. You could, and you should, and you don't. Here's an even stronger word. You won't. I mean, don't might mean you're careless. Won't probably means you're stubborn. And either one's called disaster. Now, how do you change all that the next six years? By the time I'm 31, I'm a millionaire. How about that? Well, strangely enough, during that second six years of my economic life, the economy was about the same, and prices were about the same, and everything else was about the same. Circumstances were about the same. Then how come I got rich? How come I totally changed my life? I was not the same. I started with my philosophy. I started mending my errors by doing some better thinking changing my mind, coming up with ideas that I didn't have before I met my teacher. And once that whole process started for me, I'm telling you, I changed my whole life within a six-year period. I was never the same, and I've kept up that process all these years. Your philosophy is going to determine whether or not you go for the disciplines or continue the errors. That's called potential. Everybody has it within their vow. I didn't say, hey, as simple as an apple a day, as simple as a walk around the block. Why not start right there? If you don't start there, where else are you going to start? Might as well start where it's easy, then go to the more complicated, because you can't handle the complicated, the simple disciplines. How can you handle the complicated? Thank you. Hold on. There's number two. Number one, we're affected by philosophy. First major of the five major pieces. Number two is attitude. We're affected by how we feel. First, we're affected by what we know, decisions we make. Second, we're affected by attitude, how we feel. It's how you feel about the past. Got to have a good attitude about the past. Let the past be a schoolmaster to teach you not to threaten you, but to teach you. Next, it's how you feel about the future. Goal setting, the promise of the future, is an awesome affect on your life every day. Without a future well designed, we take hesitant steps. You know, do you have to have hesitant steps for six years? 
You can have driven into a corner, not boldly willing to go and take your portion, take your share. Next, it's how you feel about everybody else. Got to have a good attitude about everybody else because it takes everybody else to make a mark. And here's the last one, that's how you feel about yourself. Understanding self-worth is the beginning. Self-worth should be easy. If one of us could do it, all of us can. If anybody can think it, we all think it. I can read. You can read. I can understand. You can understand. From where I came from, a few simple things. I didn't try revolutionize my life in five years. Is there anybody here that can't do it? Change from pennies to fortune? Change from batty to something? Change from broke to rich? That's the attitude about yourself. So valuable. Okay, now in transforming our lives, we don't start with attitude. We don't start with inspiration. We start with education. Life change starts with education. You've got to be educated to the point of where you might have messed up. And all you've got to do is write down through the list. You don't need some teacher to come by and tell you, be your own best teacher saying, hey, let me make a list of some places I've messed up. Because if you let this down, let this down, that probably affects the rest. And the answer is, that's true. So we don't start with inspiration. We start with education. What's the first education? If it isn't going well, and you live in America, you have foreign countries. You say, well, the country's messed up. That's like cursing the soil and cursing the seed and the sunshine and the rain, which is all you've got. Don't curse the soil. You get your own planet. You can rearrange this whole deal. This one you've got to take like it comes. So, number two is attitude. Here was number three, activity. This is the work part, the labor part, taking action. The activity is the miracle working piece. Miracle being something we don't quite understand how it works. Doesn't mean it doesn't work if you're willing to straighten it out. Here's one of the keys. It's called activity. It's called disciplines. Turning wisdom from your philosophy and inspiration, strengthening of attitude and faith, courage, commitment, all this stuff that comes from attitude. If you're willing to take these two qualities, philosophy and attitude, and invest them into activity, you can have a miracle. Anything short of that, no miracle. Wisdom doesn't perform a miracle. Attitude doesn't perform a miracle. The only thing that performs a miracle of increase is called equity. It's called putting wisdom and attitude into disciplined labor. This labor now can perform a miracle. And here are the two parts of the labor. One, do what you can. Number two, do the best you can. Can't give you better advice than that. Number one, do what you can. You just got to go home and make a list after today. And here's the question to ask as you make this personal list. What am I not doing that would be easy to do that could greatly change my health? My wealth? What am I not doing? I'm neglecting it. Would be easy to do if you'll take care of your part. Call putting it into activity. Action works miracles. But here's how you get a miracle going for your life. Number one, do what you can. Get a list of the stuff you could do and you haven't done. Postpone and start cleaning that up. You can't start at a better place for personal change. It'll affect your bank account, affect your future, affect your income, affect everything. You can't start a better life change process than cleaning up what you should be doing. The man says, well, my mother lives down in Florida. I should have written her six months ago. I just can't seem to get that letter written. I'm asking you to get that letter in. Clean that up and don't walk like other people walk. Don't postpone like other people postpone. You say, well, is it as simple as writing a letter? And the answer is yes. Where else would you start for life change, personal change? You don't need a big package to fall out of the sky. You don't need massive bombardment. Pre-conscious, subconscious practice channeling. Find a 2,000-year-old guru. I mean, you don't need any of that stuff. Pass on all that. Kids are afraid of that stuff. Too much of it. You'll be out on a limb with Shirley. I mean, no. Pass on all this stuff. This stuff's too easy. This stuff's too simple. It's called taking action. Number one, correct neglect, correct errors in discipline. Number two, start setting up some disciplines. And if you'll do that, you'll perform a miracle. Now here's the second part of the miracle. Number one is do what you can. Here's number two. Do the best you can. If that's not your philosophy, I would have to do amend it. A guy slips in late. 
Company doesn't seem to mind. Slips out early. First one in the parking lot heading for happy hour. Stretches his break. Comes early for lunch. Late back from lunch. Company doesn't seem to notice. Guy says, best as I can calculate, I'm putting in about a half a day's work and I'm collecting a full day's pay. And the guy says, I got it, mate. Little does he know is the seeds of his own disaster are already being sown by the weakness of his own personal philosophy. It's not the economy that's going to determine your next six years. It's your philosophy about labor, about activity, about miracle, about soil and seed, sunshine and rain, the economy, the banks, the money, the companies, the schools and what's going on. It's your philosophy and your attitude and then your ability to take action. All of that we call the process of life change miracle working. Here was number four. Results. Every once in a while you've got to take a measure to see how you're doing with these three pieces. Philosophy, attitude, activity. Now we take a measure called results. What are the results at the end of the day? The results at the end of the week. You can't let too much time go by without checking. When time goes by six years, I've been out there working. When I met my teacher, Mr. Shoff, he said, well, Mr. Ron, let's just go through a little summary here. He said, in the last six years, how much money have you saved and invested? Let's go through a little tab list here. How much money have you saved and invested in the last six years? I said, what? Zero. He said, you have messed up. You remember these notes. I like that. Messed up? He said, who sold you on that plan? I thought, my gosh, the man's right. I'm a nice guy. I bought the wrong plan. What if you were 50 and broke? Right. Didn't need to change countries. Bought the wrong plan. What a sad scenario that would be. Shof said, these questions, let's go through some results. He said, how many books have you read in the last 90 days? I said, what? Zero. Wisdom of the world available. Change your life. Change your future. Wisdom of the world available. Develop any skill you want. Earn the kind of income you want. Have all the treasures you want. Equities you want. Relationships with your family that you want. Everything that you want available and the wisdom of the world to help you get it. Haven't read any books in the last 90 days? My teacher said, Mr. Ron, you have messed up. I'm telling you, you've got the deal. Shof said, Mr. Ron, in the last six months, how many classes have you taken to improve your skills or to develop new skills? Go for the American dream. Become rich and powerful and sophisticated and healthy and influential. How many classes have you taken in the last six months? I said, how many? Zero. He said, you have messed up. Said, you don't need to unmess the country. You don't need to straighten out the perplexed. You don't need to straighten out any of this stuff. All you've got to do is look within and let results teach you a great deal about your own activity, your own attitude, and your own philosophy. I went through that process. Here's all life asks us to do. Make measurable progress in reasonable time. Some things you've got to check every day. Some things you've got to check at least by the end of the week. A salesman joins us. A little sales company supposed to make 10 calls the first week. Wouldn't it be legitimate calling in on Friday and say, John, how many calls? I mean, this stuff is simple. John says, well, say, John, well, won't fit in this little box here. Well, now John starts with the story. You say, John, I made this little box so small so a story won't fit. I don't need a story. I need what? A number. What will a number tell me? Everything. John's supposed to make 10 calls. What if he made 20? You'd say, wow. What if he only made one call? Will that tell us something about John's philosophy? And the answer is yes. Will it tell us something about his attitude? Of course. Will it tell us something about his disciplines? Of course. And if he wants a lesson in life change, all he has to do is be willing to face the numbers and come up with the results. That will teach you to either celebrate if you've got good results or fix whatever needs to be fixed in your philosophy, attitude, and activity called disciplines. You don't need to go anywhere else. I do believe in affirmations. Now, if you need a little additional affirmation, you just put up there on 40 and broke. I mean, you know, that ought to do it. And if you need just a little more, put up there, I live in America and I'm 40 and broke. That's enough to turn your life around. It says, hey, Something is wrong somewhere. I have messed up. And I'm telling you, 
If you'll start with that, it's called the process of life change. And it doesn't matter how small the process is to start. One discipline starts it, and then one discipline feeds another, feeds another, and the first thing you know, you've got this whole cycle in an upward, positive motion. It's called life change, called income change. It's called health change, relationship with your family change. Equities unprecedented that you could have in numbers that will stagger the imagination if you do not curse what's available and start amending what's possible to get the results that you want. Anybody can do this stuff. Results are the name of the game. Success is a numbers game. Good note to me said that it's a numbers game. You've got to go for the number. You've got to understand what the numbers are. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I want to announce a secret that has the potential to transform your life in ways you never thought possible. It's a habit so powerful, so profound, that once you hold it, you'll unlock a supply of untapped potential within yourself. A potential that will propel you to heights beyond your wildest imagination. You see, in today's fast-paced world, it's easy to feel overwhelmed, to succumb to the pressures and demands of daily life. But amidst the chaos, there exists a habit, a simple yet profound practice that has the power to set you apart from the crowd, to elevate you to a level of success and fulfillment that few ever attain. What is this habit, you may ask? Well, I'll tell you, it's the habit of insert habit here. Now, you might be wondering what makes this habit so special. The answer lies in its transformative power, its ability to shape your thoughts, actions, and ultimately your destiny. So as we go on board together today, I urge you to open your mind and your heart to the possibility of adopting this powerful habit. Allow yourself to imagine the extraordinary impact it can have on your life, the doors it can open, the opportunities it can create, the dreams it can turn into reality. Thank you for joining me on this exploration of the power of habit. Now let's enter on and discover the incredible potential that lies within each and every one of us to become truly powerful beyond belief. The journey to success is not a light stroll, but a challenging voyage that requires the unwavering commitment to follow the path of discipline. With each step, we draw closer not only to our goals, but also to the best version of ourselves. Discipline is not a shackle that confines us, but the wings that lift us to unforeseen heights. It is the beacon that illuminates our path in the dark nights of uncertainty steadfastly guiding us to the safe shores of success. In the annals of history, we find tales of giants whose achievements echoed through the ages. Behind every monumental feat, we discover the indelible footprint of discipline, forging legends that inspire and challenge all those who aspire to greatness. So today, in this sacred space of reflection, I invite each of you to embrace discipline as the catalyst for your own destiny. May every act of self-discipline be a brick that builds the bridge between your dreams and the reality you yearn to achieve on this journey of discovery and conquest. Let us always remember that discipline is not just a means to an end, but a loyal companion on the extraordinary journey that is life. With it by our side, we become architects of our destiny, sculpting success with the mastery of those who understand that greatness is the result of sustained discipline. May this discourse be the spark that ignites the flame of discipline in every present heart. And together, let us forge a future where success is the resounding echo of our efforts. Several years ago, I met a renowned authority in personal development, Cop Major. This expert uncovered principles of success, and by the time I met him, he had published four books, each containing 250 of these principles. I asked him which one he considered the most important, and he immediately said it was discipline, which he defined as the ability to force yourself to do what you should at the moment you should, whether you like the idea or not. After interviewing 500 of the wealthiest people in the United States, Napoleon Hill also concluded that discipline was the key to becoming rich. Tom Zick, the famous sales coach, once said, success depends on tons of discipline. Jim Rohn said, discipline weighs ounces, but regret weighs tons. Dr. Edward Banfield of Harvard University concluded that long-term perspective was the key to social and economic ascent. Over 50 years of research, Banfield found that people who achieved great success were able to delay short-term gratification to enjoy even greater rewards in the long term. The key word in this concept is sacrifice. 
Therefore, saving and investing in the present is essential for economic success in the future. Personal discipline involves being able to control yourself, to master yourself, to eat the main course first and dessert last. But beware, this does not mean you cannot have enjoyable experiences, but rather that you should only try to live them once you have done hard and necessary work, and after finishing all your essential tasks. The reward for observing personal discipline comes immediately. Every time you force yourself to do the right thing, whether you like it or not, you will like yourself more, and you will respect yourself more. Your self-esteem will increase. The image you have of yourself will improve, and your brain will release endorphins that will make you feel happy and proud. In fact, every time you force yourself to comply and do the right thing, you will receive rewards. Best of all, discipline is a habit that you can also learn through practice and repetition. As I mentioned earlier, to develop a medium complexity habit, you need to perform the action for 21 days without fail. Sometimes you can form a habit faster, but other times it takes longer. It all depends on you, on how determined you are. A few years ago, a businessman named Herbert Gray began to investigate and search for what he called the common denominator of success. He interviewed successful people for 11 years and eventually concluded that it was people who formed the habit of doing what mediocre people did not do. It turns out that successful people don't like doing those things either, but they force themselves to do them because they realize that's the price they must pay if they want to succeed. Rich DeBoss, co-founder of Amway, once said, There are many things in life that I don't like doing, such as finding new customers or selling and spending nights and weekends building a business. Nevertheless, I do them because that's the only way I can later do the things I truly enjoy. Every time you exercise your personal discipline, you strengthen all your other positive qualities. And similarly, if you are weak in discipline, the weakness spreads to all other areas of your personality. Ladies and gentlemen, let's enter on seven disciplines that hold the power to elevate every aspect of your life. Disciplines that you can bring on within yourself. First and foremost is the discipline of clear thinking. Thomas Edison once remarked that thinking was the most challenging discipline of all, a sentiment echoed by many throughout history. Indeed. There exists a spectrum of individuals, those who actively engage in deep thinking, those who believe they do, and those who shy away from the mental exertion it demands. Take a moment to ponder the pivotal issues and dilemmas in your life. Carve out extended periods to do so, be it 30, 60, or 90 minutes. As the great Peter Drucker noted, hasty decisions often lead to regrettable outcomes. Instead, deliberate over your family, career, finances, and other fundamental aspects with utmost care. Sit quietly, embrace solitude, and allow your thoughts to roam freely. Aristotle famously stated, Wisdom is the combination of experience and reflection. The deeper your contemplation, the richer the insights you glean from your experiences. Regular periods of solitude activate your superconsciousness and awaken intuition, guiding you towards clarity and resolution. Consider maintaining a journal, jotting down the intricacies of your challenges. Sometimes, the act of articulating your thoughts on paper can display solutions. Engage in activities like walking or exercise for 30 to 60 minutes. They foster clarity of thought and bolster decision-making prowess. Additionally, look for counsel from a trusted confidant, someone detached from the emotional entanglements of your predicament. A fresh perspective can often illuminate new pathways and redefine your understanding of the situation. Always challenge assumptions. Ask yourself, what am I assuming? What assumptions underpin my perspective on this situation? By scrutinizing these underlying beliefs, you open the door to overwhelming insights and transformative growth. Alec McKenzie, a time management specialist, once wrote, Wrong assumptions are the origin of all failures. What are your assumptions? What situations do you assume to be true? What if you were wrong? What if you are acting based on false information? Always remain open to the possibility of being wrong in the course you have taken. Open your mind to the idea of doing something different, completely different, to the possibility of not knowing all the facts as you thought, or at least that not all the facts are true and correct. The second discipline that will help you succeed is to set a goal every day. This practice has transformed my life and the lives of thousands of people. Now that you know that focus and concentration are essential aspects of success, start by asking yourself, what do I really want to do with my life? Ask yourself this question again and again until you have a clear answer.
Imagine you have $20 million in cash, but you only have 10 years left to live. What would you change immediately? Imagine that nothing limits you. Imagine that you have a magic wand that gives you access to all the time, money, education, experience, and contacts. What would you do? I'll give you an exercise. Buy a notebook and write in it every day. Write down 10 goals in PPP format, positive, present, and personal. Start each goal with the word I, followed by an action verb. You could write, for example, I earn X amount of dollars by such date. Every day before starting the day, rewrite your top 10 goals in the present tense, as if you had already achieved them, and only rewrite the goals on a new piece of paper, without looking at the previous one. In other words, rewrite them from memory. Watch how they develop and change over time. And as you rewrite them, many people tell me that this discipline of setting goals every day has changed their lives faster than they imagine. Once I gave a talk in Galveston, Texas, and the person who introduced me stood up and said, I have to tell you about my experience with Bree Tracy. Then he took out a notebook and continued. When I met him, he told me to write down my goals every day, and I started doing it immediately. That completely changed my life, he explained, waving the notebook in the air. I achieved all the goals I wrote down. I had never done anything so powerful in my life. Do it. It's an excellent discipline. The third discipline is to manage your time daily. Every minute spent planning saves 10 in execution. The more you plan, the more you will make the most of your time, and the more you will achieve. Imagine this. If you spend between 10 and 12 minutes every morning planning your day because that's all it would take, you would save 120 minutes that you could use to achieve your goals, that is, two hours daily. This represents a 25% increase in productivity, and all as a result of planning your day early. Start by making a list of everything you will do. The best time to write the list is the night before, because that way, your subconscious can work on it while you sleep. Organize the list by priorities. Before you start working, review it and analyze everything you have to do. Define what is most and least important. Practice the 80-20 rule, which says that 80% of your results come from 20% of your activities. What are the most valuable activities and tasks? Use the ABCD method to establish priorities. You already know that this method is based on taking into account the consequences of doing or not doing a particular task. Let's recap. An A task is something you must do without fail because not completing it could have serious consequences. A B task is something you should do. Not completing it only entails mild consequences. A C task is something nice to do, but it doesn't really matter whether you do it or not. A D task is something you delegate, and you know you should delegate as many tasks as possible. Finally, an E task is something you eliminate, to so eliminate everything you can to free up as much time as possible. Once you have written A, B, C, D, or E next to your tasks, organize the list by A1, A2, A3, and then B1, B2, B3, etc. Early in the morning, start with task A1, and from that moment on, form the discipline of focusing absolutely on it until it is completed. The discipline of managing time well extends to all other forms of personal discipline and has immediate rewards because it gives you better results, as well as long-term satisfaction in terms of the quality of your life and work. The fourth is the discipline of courage. This requires you to do what you should to face your fears instead of avoiding or evading them. As I mentioned earlier, the greatest obstacle to success is the fear of failure, which is expressed in that feeling that makes you say, I can't, I can't. Courage is a habit that is developed by practicing it whenever necessary. Emerson said, do what you fear, and your fear will surely die. Make a habit of confronting your fears instead of avoiding them. Every time you face and approach it, especially if it involves another person, group, or situation, fear diminishes and you become braver and bolder. Actor Glenn Ford once said, if you don't do what you fear, fear will control your life. Repeat these words to yourself. I can do it, I can do it. Do it over and over until you gather enough courage and confidence in yourself. This phrase will nullify your fears. The fifth discipline serves to develop high-level health habits. Your goal should be to live 100 years with impeccable health. Design and imagine your ideal body. How would it look if it were perfect in every way? This will be your goal. The key to health and fitness can be summed up in five words. Eat less and exercise more. Develop the discipline of exercising every day. Even if you can only take a short walk, it's best to exercise in the morning. As soon as you wake up and before you have time to think about it, 
jump out of bed and get moving. If you do it for 21 days, it will become part of your daily routine for the rest of your life. What I do is leave my workout clothes next to my bed. That way when I wake up, I practically fall onto them, get dressed, and start moving before I have time to think about it. Give it a try. The sixth discipline is regular saving and investing. Two topics I've already talked about. Decide today to get out of debt. Stay that way and achieve financial independence. Make the decision and stop longing, waiting, and praying. Just do it. Your goal and everyone else's should be to achieve financial independence as soon as possible in their lives. This requires continuous financial discipline that you must exercise with every dollar you earn. I insist the key is to save 10, 15, or even 20% of your income throughout your life. If you're already in debt, start by saving 1% of what you earn and form the discipline of living on the remaining 99% until it becomes a habit. Form the discipline of living with what's left. It is essential that you change the way you think. Stop saying to yourself, I love to spend, and start saying, I love to save. When you were a child and were given money, you probably went out into the street to buy sweets. Although you are now an adult, you are still conditioned by that childish behavior. And that's why every time you receive money, you think about going out and buying the adult sweets, a trip, clothes, a car, a meal at a fancy restaurant. If you ask people what they would do if they had a mountain of money, most of them say, I would go to such a place and do such and such, spend on this and that. The first reaction is, I would spend it all. Change your way of thinking, move from, I like to spend, to, I love to save, I love to keep money in my account. I'm fascinated to see my money multiply and accumulate every month. Soon your mindset will change, and you will start thinking like successful and wealthy people do. The seventh discipline is that of continuous learning. Remember that to earn more, you have to learn more. Jim Rohn said the famous phrase, work on yourself as much as you work for your boss. Personal development is fundamental. So read texts about your field for 30 to 60 minutes every day. This will translate into one book a week and 50 books a year. Listen to audio programs in your car when you go from one place to another. This will add between 500 and 1,000 hours a year. Attend seminars and take courses from experts in your field. A brilliant idea you hear in a course could save you years of intense work. Persistence equals personal discipline. The greatest test of personal discipline is persistence in the face of adversity. You can force yourself to complete your tasks no matter how you feel. Courage has two parts. The first is the courage itself to start a project, to get something going despite not having a guarantee of success. The second part is the courage to endure, to persist when you feel discouraged and tired and want to give up. Your persistence represents how much or how little you believe in yourself and your ability to succeed. This means that the more you believe in the goodness and suitability of what you do, the more persistent you will be. The more you persist, the more you will tend to believe in yourself and what you do. Napoleon Hill said, for a man or woman's character, persistence is what coal is to steal. Every time you persist, despite feeling like quitting, you become a stronger and more solid person because you take control of your own character. And over time, you become unstoppable. As we draw this discussion to a close, I want to leave you with a powerful reminder. The habit we've explored today has the potential to release a level of power and potential within you that you may never have imagined possible. By adopting this habit, by making it an integral part of your daily routine, you're tapping into a supply of strength, resilience, and determination that knows no bounds. But remember, true power doesn't come from external sources. It comes from within. It's about raising the right mindset adopting the right habits, and taking consistent action towards your goals. As you board ship of self-discovery and growth, I urge you to stay committed, stay focused, and never lose sight of the incredible potential that lies within you. Thank you for joining me on this exploration of the power of habit. Now armed with this knowledge and insight, go forth and adopt the habit that will make you truly powerful beyond belief. The world is yours for the taking. Seize it with all the strength and determination you possess. Going away and may your journey be filled with endless possibilities and abundant success.